Hello, everyone. Yeah, it's working. We're good. Good morning. Um, hope everyone's doing well. Thank you so much for joining this session, um, one of the many uh, this week on AI and AI governance, but uh, with a more focused view and perspective on a uh, global human rights approach to AI governance. My name is Ian Barber. Um, I'm legal lead at Global Partners Digital. Uh, we're a civil society organization based in London, uh, working to foster an online environment underpinned by human rights. We've been working on AI uh, governance and human rights for several years now, so I'm very happy to be uh, co-organizing, facilitating this alongside uh, Transparencia Brazil, who uh, is our online moderator, so thank you very much. What I'll be doing over the next few minutes is providing a bit of introduction to this workshop, um, setting the scene, introducing our fantastic speakers, both in person and online, and providing a bit of structure as well for the discussion that we're having today and some housekeeping rules. Really, this workshop is meant to acknowledge that we stand um, at the intersection of two realities. The increasing potential of artificial intelligence on one hand, um, and the ongoing relevance of the international human rights framework on the other. When we think of um, a human rights-based approach to AI governance, a few things come to mind. Firmly and truly grounding policy approaches in the international human rights framework, um, the ability to assess risks to human rights, promoting open and inclusive design and deployment of AI, as well as ensuring transparency and accountability amongst other elements and measures. And given this, it's probably not news to anyone in the room um, that the rapid design, development, and deployment of AI demands our attention, uh, our understanding, and our collaborative efforts across various different stakeholders. Uh, human rights, which are enshrined in various sources, such as conventions um, and customary international law, and its dynamic interpretations and evolution, it works to guide us towards our world continually where people can exercise and enjoy their human rights, to thrive without prejudice or discrimination or other forms of injustice. And like any technology, um, AI poses both benefits and risks to enjoyments of human rights. I'm sure you've attended other sessions this week where you spoke in a bit more detail about what those look like in various sectors um, and on different civil, political, economic, and social rights. Um, but today, what we're gonna be doing is narrowing in on a few key questions. Um, the first is how can the international human rights framework be leveraged uh, to ensure responsible AI governance in a rapidly changing context and world that we live in? And I think this question is important because it underscores how AI is now able to influence so many things from our job prospects, our ability to express ourselves, um, legal verdicts. Uh, and so how do we ensure that human rights continue to be respected, uh, protected, and promoted is key. Secondly, we must reflect upon the global uh, implications for human rights in the kind of ongoing proliferation of AI governance frameworks that we're seeing today and also, uh, and in the potential absence of effective frameworks, what is the result and what are we looking at? There has been this ongoing proliferation of efforts um, at the global, regional, national level to provide frameworks, rules, um, and other types of normative structures and standards that are supposed to um, promote and safeguard human rights. Um, for example, just to highlight a few, there's ongoing efforts at the Council of Europe to develop a, a binding treaty on AI. There's the European Union's efforts with the um, EU AI Act. Uh, there's UNESCO's recommendations on the ethics of AI, which is finalized but currently undergoing implementation. And other efforts such as the uh, more recently proposed uh, UN high-level advisory body on AI. But at this point, we've, we've yet to see uh, comprehensive and binding frameworks enacted at this point, um, which might be considered um, you know, effective and sufficient to protect human rights. And without these uh, safeguards and protections, we therefore risk kind of exacerbating inequality, uh, silencing marginalized groups and voices, and inadvertently creating a world where AI serves more as a divider than it does a promoter and for equality. So what do we want to see? And what do we want to do to ensure that this is not the case and not the future that we're looking at? And lastly, over the next 80 or so minutes, um, the path towards responsible AI governance is not one that can be kind of traversed alone. 
So we need to navigate these challenges together, fostering meaningful engagement by all relevant stakeholders. That's why on this panel we have voices from civil society, from private companies, um, from uh, international organizations, which are all needed. And we also need to particularly amplify voices from the global majority. Um, historically, many regions across the world are, have been left out of global dialogues um, and efforts at global governance, and that's very much the case when it comes to AI as well. So this workshop is, it's not just a gathering I see, uh, it is one, it's one for information sharing, but it's also a call to action. Um, it's really, I think, the beginning of an ongoing collective effort um, to address a range of complexities that have come about from AI. Um, and to really work to ensure the ongoing relevance of our shared human values and for human rights. So with that intro and framing, um, I'd like to get started, get the ball rolling, and kind of drawing from the diverse range of experiences here, um, really talk about what we want in terms of a global human rights approach to responsible AI governance. And to do that, we have an all-star lineup of speakers um, from, again, a number of different stakeholders. I'm gonna briefly introduce them, um, but I encourage you to all, when you make your interventions, to provide a bit more background on um, where you come from, the type of work you do, and um, really why you're here today and your motivations. Uh, and in no particular order, we have Marlena Wisniak from the European Center for Nonprofit Law, to my left. Uh, we have uh, Vladimir Jure from Derecho Societales, who's over there, hey, how's it going? Um, we, we also have Tara Denham um, from Global Affairs Canada, Hello. Uh, and we have uh, Pratik um, as well from UNESCO, so thank you for all being here in person. Uh, and online we have Shalal Name from Google, um, and uh, Oyabisi Olesi um, from the Nigeria Network of NGOs, or NNNGO. In terms of structure, we have a bit of time on our hands, um, and in, what we're gonna do then is divide the session into two parts. The first part is gonna be looking a particular focus on the international human rights framework, um, and also this ongoing proliferation of regulatory processes on AI that I've kind of alluded to already. We'll then take a, a pause uh, for questions from the audience, um, as well as those joining online as well. And um, I want to give a special shout out to Marina uh, from Transparencia Brazil, who is uh, taking in questions and, and feeding them into me so that we can have a, a hybrid conversation. Uh, and then after this first part, we'll stop and we'll have a second part, and that'll look a bit more at um, inclusion of uh, voices in these processes um, and how engagement in, uh, from the global majority is imperative. And that will be followed by a final brief Q&A session and then closing remarks. So I hope that makes sense. I hope that sounds structured enough and productive, and I look forward to your questions and interventions later. Uh, but let's get uh, into the meat of things, um, looking at the international human rights framework. We're at a point where there are various efforts on global AI governance happening at a breakneck speed. Um, and there's a, a number of them that I've mentioned, including the Hiroshima process that was just spoken about yesterday, if you guys were at the, the main event. So my first question and kind of my prompt is to, um, to my left, to Marlena. Uh, really given your work at, at ECNL um, and kind of the ongoing efforts you have to advocate for rights respecting approaches on these types of um, AI regulatory processes, what do you consider or think is missing in terms of aligning um, them with the international human rights framework? Um, and again, if you could provide a brief background and introduction, that'd be great, thanks. Sure, thanks so much, Ian, and hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to day two, I think it is, of IGF. It feels like a week already. Um, so my organization, the European Center for Nonprofit Law, is a human rights org that focuses on civic space, freedom of assembly and association, and also we work a lot on freedom of expression and privacy. And over the past five years, um, we've noticed that AI was a big risk and some extent opportunity. Um, but great potential for harm as well for activists, journalists, and human rights defenders around the world. So the first five years of our work in this space were rather quiet, um, or I'd say it was more of a niche area with only a handful of um, folks working at the intersection of human rights and AI, and by handful, I really mean like 10 to 15. And this year, um, the, the discussion around AI has really expanded um, very, very quickly, and you know, it may be a chat GPT kind of um, trailblazer issue, but um, it's great to see that at the UN there is interest um, for this topic and panels like this that bring a human rights-based approach to AI. 
So um, Ian mentioned a couple of the ongoing regulations. I won't bore you this morning with um, a lot of legalese, but the core frameworks that we focus on advocate for a human rights-based approach at ECNL are obviously the EUAI Act and trilogues are happening as I speak right now. Um, Council of Europe, Convention on AI, national laws as well. We've seen these um, expand a lot around the world recently. We engage in standardization bodies, so like the US NIST, a National Institute for Standards and Technology, and the EU San Senelec, and um, of course international organizations like OECD and the UN, and you mentioned Ian Hiroshima process, that's one we're following closely as well. In the coming years, um, as the AI Act is set to be accepted in the next couple of weeks, and um, definitely by early 2024, we'll be following the implementation of the act. And so I'll use this as a segue to, um, to talk to you a little bit about what are the core elements that we see should be part of any AI framework and AI governance that, from a human rights based approach. And that begins with human rights due diligence and meaningful human rights impact assessments in line with the UN guiding principles for business and human rights. So we really see with AI an opportunity to um, to implement mandatory human rights due diligence, including human rights impact assessments in, in the EU space that also involves other laws, but beyond EU, globally, the UN and other, um, other institutions and fora have an opportunity right now to actually mandate meaningful, inclusive, and, um, and, uh, and rights-based impact assessments. That means meaningful engaging stakeholders as well, especially external, external stakeholders like civil society organizations and affected communities around the world. And so stakeholder engagement is a necessary and cross-cutting component of AI governance, development, and use. And in ECNL, we look both at how to govern AI and then how it's developed and how it's deployed around the world. We understand stakeholder engagement is a collaborative process where diverse stakeholders, both internal and external, meaning those that develop the technologies themselves, can have a meaning, can meaningfully influence decision making. So on the governance side of things is when we consult in these processes, including a multi-stakeholder forum like IGF, do our, vo are our voices actually heard? Can they impact um, the final text and provisions of any laws or policies that are implemented? And on the AI design and development side of things, when tech companies or any deployer of AI consults with external stakeholders, do they actually implement, do they include um, their voices and do these voices inform and shape final decision making? In the context of human rights, for, uh, human rights impact assessments of AI systems, stakeholder engagement is particularly effective to understand what kind of AI systems are um, are even helpful or useful and how do they work? So looking at the product and service side of AI, machine learning, or any algorithmic-based data analytics systems, we really can, um, uh, we, we can shape better regulation and develop better systems by including these stakeholders. Importantly, external stakeholders can identify specific potential positive or adverse impacts on human rights such as the implications, benefits, and harms of these systems on people and um, looking at marginalized and already vulnerable groups in particular. If you're interested to learn more about stakeholder engagement, check out our framework for meaningful engagement. So shameless plug to Google or go on our website and look up framework for meaningful engagement, where we provide concrete recommendations for engaging internal and external stakeholders in AI systems. And these recommendations can also be used for AI governance as a whole. Um, moving on, I'd like to touch base, uh, touch on transparency briefly, which in addition to human rights impact assessments and stakeholder engagement, we see as a prerequisite for AI accountability and, and a rights-based global AI governance. So um, not to go too much to detail, but um, we believe that AI governance should mandate that AI developers and deployers report on data sets, including training data sets, performance and accuracy metrics, false positives and fa false negatives, human in the loop and human review, and access to remedy. 
Um, if you'd like to learn more about that, um, I urge you to look at our recent paper published of Access Now just a couple weeks ago on the EU Digital Services Act with a spotlight on um, algorithmic systems, and we outline our vision for what, um, trans what meaningful transparency would look like. Finally, um, access to remedy is a key part of any govern me uh, governance mechanism that includes both internal grievance mechanisms within tech companies and AI developers, as well as um, obviously state um, remedy at the state level and judicial mechanisms, which are, um, as a reminder, states are, have the primary responsibility to protect human rights and give remedy when these are harmed. Um, and one, I'd say, like aspect that we often see in um, AI governance efforts, especially by governments, are to include an exemption for national security or counterterrorism and broadly emergency measures. And at ECNL, we, we caution against overbroad exemptions that are too vague, um, broadly defined, as these can be at best misused as worst weaponized to restrict on civil liberties. So if there are any exemptions for uh, things like national security or counterterrorism and AI governance, we really urge to have narrow, um, narrow scope, include sunset clauses for emergency measures, meaning that if any, um, um, if any exemptions are in place, they will end within um, due time, and focus on proportionality. And finally, um, what is missing? So what we see today, both in the EU and globally as well, is that AI governance efforts mostly take a risk-based approach. And the risk part is often to finance, business, um, I mentioned national security, uh, terrorism, these kind of things, but rarely, um, rarely human rights. And the AI Act itself in the EU is regulated under product liability and market approach, not fundamental rights. In our research paper of 2021, we outlined key criteria for evaluating the risk level of AI systems from a human rights-based approach. And that means that we recommend determining the level of risk based on the product design, the severity of the impact, any internal due diligence mechanisms, causal link between the AI system and adverse human rights impacts, and potential for remedy. And all these, um, all these examples help us really focus on the harms of AI to human rights. And last thing, and then I'll, um, um, I'll stop here, where AI systems are fundamentally incompatible with human rights, such as biometric surveillance deployed in public spaces, including facial and emotional recognition, we, along with a coalition of civil society organizations, advocate for a ban of such systems, and we've seen proliferation of laws, like in the US, for example, the state level, and right now, um, in the latest version of the AI Act adopted by the European Parliament of such bans. So um, that means prohibitions, pro prohibiting the use of facial recognition and remote biometric recognition, technologies that enable mass surveillance and discriminatory targeted surveillance in public and publicly accessible spaces by the government. And we urge the UN um, and other processes such as the Hiroshima um, to include such bans. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Marlena, that was amazing. I think you actually just followed up to my uh, immediate question, which was um, what is really needed when it comes to AI systems that do pose an unacceptable risk to human rights. So thank you for preemptively responding. Um, and I very much agree that it, having mandatory due diligence, um, including impact assessments of human rights, uh, is imperative. Um, I think the what you spoke to in terms of stakeholder engagement rings true, um, as well as the issue of transparency um, and the needs to, for that to foster meaningful accountability and also introducing remedies. So, so thank you very much for that overview. Um, I think based on that, um, considering that there are these initiatives and there are so many different elements to consider, whether it's transparency, accountability, or, or scope, I'll turn to, to you, Tara, um, and ask, um, given all this, how is a government such as Canada approaching um, AI governance and considering human rights? What are, it, in terms of both your domestic priorities, um, in terms of kind of regional or international engagement? Um, so if you could speak a bit to how these are all feeding together, that'd be great. Thank you. Sure, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to participate on the panel. Uh, so as was said, I'm Director General of the Office of Human Rights, Freedoms and Inclusion at Global Affairs Canada. Uh, which I think also warrants perhaps a bit of an explanation, um, but I think actually aligns really well as a starting position. 
because within the Office of Human Rights, Freedoms and Inclusion is actually where we've been em embedded the responsibility for digital policy and cybersecurity policy from a global affairs perspective. And so that was our starting point for which, uh, since the integration of those policy positions and that policy work a number of years ago, it was always starting from a human rights perspective. Um, and so this goes back, I think, about six or seven years that we actually created this office and integrated the, the human rights perspective into our digital policy from the beginning and some of our initial positions on the development of AI considerations and the geopolitics of artificial intelligence. So I think that in and of itself is perhaps unique uh, in some of the structures. Having said that, I, I would also acknowledge that a lot of the government structures, we are all trying to figure out how to approach this. Uh, but as the DG responsible for these, it does give a great opportunity to, from the beginning, integrate that human rights uh, policy position. Um, when we were first starting to frame some of our AI thinking and our, from a foreign policy lens, it was always from the human rights perspective. I can't say that that has always meant we've known how to do it, <laughs> uh, but I could say that's always been pushing us uh, to sort of think and challenge ourselves of how can we use the existing human rights frameworks? How can we advocate that at every venture, including domestically? So I wanted to give perhaps a snapshot of uh, sort of the framing of how we're uh, approaching it in Canada. Um, some of our national perspectives and then how we're linking that to the international um, and of course integrating how we address some of the uh, integrating a diversity of voices into that um, in a concrete way. So I would say when we started uh, talking about this a number of years ago, it was the, the debate and I'm sure many of you participated in this debate. Um, it was a lot around, you know, should it be legislation first? Should it be guiding principles? Are there frameworks? Are we going to do voluntary? For a number of years, that was sort of the cycle we were in. And I would say over the last year and a half to two years, that's not a debate anymore. We have to do all of them, and they're going to be going at the same time. So now I think uh, where, where I'm standing is it's more about how are we going to integrate and how are we going to feed off of each other as we're moving domestic at the same time as the international. And so we have to, you know, typically, uh, from a policy perspective, um, you would have your national positions defined and those would inform your international uh, positions. And right now that's, the world is, is just moving at an incredible pace, so we're, we're doing it at the same time and we have to find those, those intersections but also takes a conscious decision across government. It, and I, when I say across government, I mean across our national government. Um, and of course this is within the framework which we're all very familiar with which is Domestically, we are also all aiming to harness AI to the greatest capacities uh, because of all of the benefits that, that there, there are, but we're always uh, very aware of the risks. And so that is a very real uh, tension that we need to always be integrating into the policy discussions that we're having. And our belief and our, our position in our national policy development and international is that is where the, the diversity of voices are absolutely required because the risk views will be very different depending on the voice and the community uh, that is actually that you're inviting and that you're actually engaging in the conversation in a meaningful way. So it's not just inviting to the conversation, it's actually listening uh, and then shaping your policy position. So um, in Canada, what we've seen is, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into great detail, but just, uh, just to give you a snapshot of where we've started is like within a, the last four years, we've had a, auto, uh, a directive on how uh, automated decision making will be handled by the government of Canada. And that was accompanied by an algorithmic impact assessment tool. That was sort of the first uh, wave of direction that we gave in terms of how the government of Canada was going to engage with automated decision making. Um, then over the last little while, uh, again, in the last year, there's been a real push related to generative AI. So now in, I think it was just in the last couple months, uh, there was the release of a guide on how to use generative AI within, within the public sector. And uh, a key point I wanted to note here is that um, it is a requirement to engage stakeholders before deploying generative AI by the Government of Canada. Uh, before we're actually going to roll it out, we have to engage with, uh, with those that will actually be impacted, whether it be uh, for public use or service delivery. 
Uh, and then just last month, a voluntary code of conduct on responsible development and management of advanced generative AI systems. Um, this, again, we've seen uh, the US uh, with similar announcements. Uh, we've seen the G7, uh, uh, work that we're doing in the G7, and a lot of these codes of conduct uh, and principles coming out at the same time. Um, and this is also accompanied in Canada by working through legislation so that we also have an AI and data act uh, going through legislation. So as I said, these are, these are the, the um, basis of the, of the regulations in the policy world that we're working in within Canada. Um, and what I comment there is that these are all then developed by multiple departments. Okay, so that's where um, I, I think we're challenging ourselves as policymakers because we have to also increase our capability to work across the sectors, um, to, across the departments. Um, and, and I would say from where we started with when we were developing Canada's Directive on Automated Decision Making through to the actual uh, code of conduct that was just announced, that was uh, moving from you know, informal consultations across the country, trying to engage with private sector and academia, to uh, the voluntary code being consulted. We have national tables set up now, which does include private sector, civil society, uh, federal, provincial, territorial governments, indigenous communities. So we've also had to make a journey through what it means from sort of ad hoc consultation to formalized consultation uh, when we're actually developing these codes. Um, so then how does that translate internationally? Uh, as we're learning domestically at a rapid pace, uh, perhaps I can just pull on a few examples of how we've then tried to reflect that internationally. And I'm gonna harken back to the UNESCO, uh, UNESCO recommendations on the ethics of AI uh, from 2021. So this is where, um, again, it was making that conscious decision about harnessing our national tables uh, that were in place to define our negotiating positions when we would be going internationally, uh, given that, again, our, our national positions weren't as defined. Um, and then we also wanted to leverage the existing international structures. And I think that's really important as we talk about the plethora of international, um, international structures at play. So this is where we've used the Freedom Online Coalition. Uh, so you have to look at the structures that you have, the opportunities that exist, and what are the means by which we can do wide consultation on the negotiating positions that we're taking. So for the UNESCO uh, recommendations, that's where we use the Freedom Online Coalition, uh, with, and they have a, the advisory network, which also includes civil society and tech companies. So again, it's about proactively seeking those opportunities, shaping your uh, negotiating positions, um, in a conscious way, um, and then bringing those to the table. We're also involved in the Council of Europe uh, negotiations on AI and human rights, um, which is, again, um, leveraging our tables, but it's also advocating to have a more diverse representation of countries at the table. Uh, so you have to seize the opportunity. We do see this as an opportunity uh, to engage effectively in this uh, negotiation. And we want to continue to advocate that more countries uh, are participating and that more stakeholder groups can, can engage. Um, so maybe I'll just finish by saying some of the lessons that we've learned from doing this. Um, it's really easy to recite that and make it sound like it was, uh, you know, Easy to do, it's not. Uh, some, of the uh, some of the lessons I would pull out, number one, uh, stakeholder engagement requires a deliberate decision to integrate from the start. And, it, that is, and I, just, I guess the most important word in that one is deliberate. <laughs> um, you have to think about it from the beginning, you have to put that in place. Um, as I've said a few times, you have to think about and make sure that you're creating that space for the voices to be heard and then uh, actually following through on that. The second one, that it does take time, it's complex, and there will be tensions. And there should be tensions, because if there's not tensions in the perspectives, then you probably haven't created a wide enough uh, a wide enough table of a diversity of voices. So you have to, uh, I think my team is probably tired of me saying this, but you have to get comfortable with living in a zone of discomfort. If you're not in a zone of discomfort, you're probably not pushing uh, your policy, your own, per your, your view. And again, I'm, I'm coming from a policy perspective. Uh, and you have to do that to find the best solutions. 
Uh, as policymakers, it is going to also drive us to sort of increase our expertise. Um, so we're, bring, we're seeing a lot of, you know, yes, we would traditionally come to the tables with our policy knowledge um, and our human rights experience and those sort of elements, but I think, uh, you know, we've tried a lot of different things in terms of integrating expertise into our, into our teams, integrating expertise into our uh, consultations, so you have to sort of think about what it's going to mean in a policy world to now do this. Um, and finally, I'll just say, um, again, leveraging the structures that are in place. We have to optimize what we have. Um, it's, I think, sometimes easier to say, well, it's broken and let's create something new. But I, I do want to think that we can continue to optimize. And if we're going to create something new, we, again, it's a conscious decision to think about what is missing from what we have uh, that needs to be improved upon. Perhaps I'll stop there. Thank you, Tara. That was great and really comprehensive. I think in the beginning you alluded to the challenges in applying the international human rights uh, system to um, the work that you're doing, but I'm glad Canada is very much doing that and taking this multi-pronged approach that does put human rights front and center, um, both at the national and international levels. Um, and I really uh, agree that there is um, very much a need to have deliberate stakeholder engagement and appreciate the work that you've been doing on that. Um, and the, also the need to uh, leverage existing structures um, and ensuring that these conversations are, are truly global and inclusive and, and ensuring that the expertise is there as well. So, so thank you so much. Um, and I think your comments on UNESCO actually serve as a perfect uh, segue to my, to my next prompt, which uh, I'll be turning to Pratik uh, to, um, to discuss a bit about that. Um, so UNESCO uh, developed the recommendations on the ethics of AI a couple of years ago. I think, as it's been alluded to, that the conversation has kind of gone from do we need voluntary things to, um, or self-regulatory or non-binding to do we have perhaps need more binding, and I think that is very much the direction to travel now. But I'm curious to hear from you a bit more about your experience at UNESCO in terms of implementing the, uh, the recommendation at this point um, and how UNESCO in general will be playing a larger role in, the, in AI governance moving forward and, and on human rights. Um, so thank you. Thanks, Ian. Uh, how much time do I have? You have uh, five to six minutes, but there's okay. no rush. I okay. want to hear your comments and okay. your intervention. So. Uh, first of all, thanks for organizing this uh, discussion on human rights-based approaches uh, to AI governance. Um, I, will, I will perhaps focus more on the implementation part and share some really concrete examples of the work that we are doing uh, with both rights holders and duty bearers. Uh, perhaps first it's good to mention that the recommendation on the ethics of AI is human rights based. It has uh, human rights as a core value and it is really informed by uh, human rights. Now I would focus more on the judiciary first. So while we are talking about development of voluntary frameworks, non-voluntary binding and so on, uh, there's a separate discussion about whether it's even possible in this fractured world that we are living in to have a binding instrument. It's very difficult. It's not a choice. It's If you are going to go and negotiate something today, uh, it's, it's very difficult uh, to get uh, a global view. So we have a recommendation which is uh, adopted by 193 countries. So that's that's a... That's an excellent place to start with. And I'm really looking forward to the work that colleagues at the Council of Europe are doing uh, to, to have a regional and also they work with other countries. Now, so we started to also, in my team, in my files, uh, looking at the judiciary because you can already start working with duty bearers and implement human, international human rights law uh, through their decisions. But the challenge that you face is that a lot of times they don't have enough awareness about what AI is. Uh, how does it work? There's a lot of uh, myth involved. And uh, there is also this assumption that technology is out there. It will, you know, if you're, if you're using an AI system or in a lot of countries they're using for predictive purposes, uh, they would be like, oh yeah, it's the computer algorithm which is giving the score, it must be right. So all these kind of things need to be broken down and explained, and then the relevant links with uh, international human rights law needs to be established. So this is what we started to do in sometime around 2020. Um, we at UNESCO have an initiative called the Global Judges Initiative. 
uh, which started in 2013, where we are working on freedom of expression, access to information, and safety of journalists. And through this work, we've reached about 35,000 judicial operators in 160 countries through both online trainings in the form of massive open online courses to uh, in-person trainings to helping uh, national judicial training institutions develop curriculum. Uh, around 2020, we started to discuss artificial intelligence. Of course, the recommendation was under development, and we were thinking already about how can we actually implement beyond uh, the great agreement that we have amongst countries. And uh, we first launched a survey to this network and about uh, 1,200 judicial operators, when I say judicial operators, judges, lawyers, prosecutors, uh, people working in legal administrations responded to this survey from about 100 countries. And they said two things. First, we want to learn on how AI can be used within the judicial processes and the administrative processes, because in a lot of countries, uh, uh, they are overworked and understaffed. And I've been talking to judges, and they're like, yeah, if I take a holiday, my colleagues have to work like 16 hours a day. Uh, and th that is a key driver for them to look at uh, how can the workload be, be streamlined. The next aspect is really about what are the legal and human rights implications of AI. And when it comes to, say, freedom of expression, uh, safety of access to information. And let me give you some examples here. So we have, uh, for instance, in Brazil, there was a case uh, in the Sao Paulo metro system. They were using a facial recognition system on their doors to detect your emotions and then show advertisement. and. Uh, so the, I think it was the Data Protection Authority in Brazil which, uh, which said that you can't do that. You have no, no permission to collect this data and so on. And this did not require really an AI framework. So my point is that we should not think in just one direction that we have to work on a framework and then implement human rights, but we, can, we already have international human rights law which is part of jurisprudence in a lot of countries, which can directly be used, actually. So let's not give uh, a lot of people the reason to wait. Let's have a regulation in our country. Giving you some other examples, uh, we've seen in Italy, for instance, they have um, um, these food delivery apps like uh, Deliveroo, and there's another one called Foodino, and they had two cases there where uh, the basically one of those apps, I don't remember which one, was uh, penalizing the food delivery drivers if they were canceling their scheduled deliveries for whatever reason, and they were giving them a negative score. So the, bio, the, the algorithm was found to be biased. It was uh, rating those who cancel, giving more negative points uh, to them vis-a-vis -vis the others. And uh, the Data Protection Authority basically said from the GDPR that you cannot have this going. Um, we had the case uh, Marlena was mentioning about uh, facial recognition in the public sphere. I think it was in the UK, the South Wales Police Department was using uh, facial recognition systems in the public sphere. And this went to the Court of Appeals, and then they said, oh, you can't do this. So. Uh, this is the work, these are just examples of what is already happening and how people have already applied the, uh, international human rights standards and so on. Now, what are we doing next? So uh, in our program on, uh, with our work with the judiciary, we have, uh, we launched in 2022 a massive open online course on AI and the rule of law, which covers all these dimensions and we made it available in seven languages. And we, it was kind of a participative dialogues, dialogue. We had the president of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. We had the chief justice of India. We had uh, professors. We had people from the civil society coming and sharing their experiences from different parts of the world. Because everyone wants to learn in this domain. There's, like as Canada, you were mentioning, uh, there's a lot of scope to learn from what are the practices in other countries. And so that was our first product, which reached about 4,500 judicial operators in 138 countries. Now we realize that doing individual capacity building is one thing, 
but we need to focus more on institutional capacity building because that's more sustainable in the long term. So we've now, with also the support of the European Commission, uh, developed a global toolkit on AI and the rule of law, which is essentially a curriculum which, uh, which has four modules, which is talking about human rights impact assessments that Marlena was talking about before. Uh, we are actually going to go to the judiciary and say, okay, this is how you can break things down. This is how you look at data. What is the quality of data? When, you are, when you're using an AI system, uh, how do you check whether the algorithm is, what was the data used, what, whether it was representative or not? So we are breaking these things down practically for, for them to, to start questioning at least. Uh, you don't expect judges to become AI experts at all, but at least to have that mindset to say, oh, it's, it's a computer, but it is not infallible. So we need to, we need to create that. So we have this curriculum, which uh, we developed through also a, almost a year-long process now of, of reviews and so on. Now we have the pilot uh, toolkit available, which we are implementing first with the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in November, actually next month, uh, for a regional training. Uh, we will also then get their feedback because it's important to work with the community on what works for them, also from the trainers. Uh, we are going to hopefully do it for the EU. We are going to do it in East Africa with the East African Court of Justice uh, next year. In fact, we are hosting a conference, organizing a conference with them uh, later this month in Kigali. So we are at this moment now piloting this work, organizing these national and regional trainings with uh, the judiciary, and then as a next step, hoping that this curriculum is picked up by the national judicial training institutions and integrated, and then they own it, they shape it, they use it, and that is how we see that it becomes you know, international human rights standards uh, percolating down to enhanced capacities through, through this kind of a program. And also as an open invitation, the toolkit that we have is, is, a, is a, we are just piloting it, so also open to having feedback from the, the human rights experts here on how we could further improve and strengthen it. So I think I'll, s perhaps I'll briefly just mention the rights holders side and we've also developed some tools for, um, for basically uh, youth or even general public, you could say, uh, to engage them in a more uh, interesting way. So we have a comic strip on AI which is now available in uh, English, French, Spanish, Kiswahili, and I think there's a language in Madagascar that is also, and in, in German and Slovenian soon. So these are tools that we make available to the communities to also then co-own, develop their language versions because part of strengthening human rights globally is also to making that content available in different languages uh, so people, people can associate with it better. We have a course on defending human rights in the age of AI, which is available in 25 languages. It's a micro-learning course on a mobile phone that we developed in a very collaborative way with uh, UNITAR, which is the United Nations Training and Research Institution, as well as um, a European project called SALTOPI, which involved youth volunteers who wanted to take it to their communities and say, oh, actually, in our country, we want this to be shared and so on. So there are a number of tools that we have and then communities of practice with whom we work on capacity building and actually translating some of this high level principles, frameworks, policies into hopefully a few years down the line into judgments which become binding uh, on, on governments, on companies and so on. Yeah, I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you, that, that's great. Um, and thank you for reminding us that we already do have a lot of frameworks and tools that can already be leveraged and are, are taking place in the domestic context as well. I um, really commend on your work uh, on AI and human rights in the judiciary. Um, I think that it's important to consider that we do need to work on kind of the institutional uh, knowledge capacity that you were speaking to um, and also working with various stakeholders in, in an inclusive manner, so thank you. Um, at this point, we've heard I, from Marlena about the kind of what's truly needed uh, from a human rights-based approach. 
at AI governance. We've heard from Tara what, um, what some governments and states like Canada are doing to champion this approach in some ways, so the domestic and national levels. You've heard from Pratik about kind of the complementary work that's being done by international organizations and kind of the implementation and work happening there. Um, so I think I wouldn't pause at this point to see if anyone on the panel um, has any immediate reactions to anything that's been said. Um, and then we might have time for, for one quick question before we change directions a little bit. But if there are any immediate reactions, do feel free to jump in. If not, that's okay too. And from online, if not. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we can also go to um, yep, a brief question, if that's possible. Um, please feel free to jump in. I think there's a microphone there, but we can also hand one over. If you could introduce yourself, that'd be great too. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm Stephen Foslu. I'm a policy specialist um, at UNICEF. Um, and it's really great to hear about the different initiatives that are happening and the different um, approaches. And maybe it's natural, like in the previous session, uh, Thomas Schneider was saying it's natural that we will see many different governments and countries approaching this differently because nobody really knows how, how to do this. So this is more kind of a, I guess, a request to, to think about not just the what, the governance, but also the how, um, and to do analysis of these different approaches and to see what works from voluntary, you know, voluntary con codes of conduct to more kind of industry-specific sp legislation. And I think that's almost really the next phase as we go from policy to practice. Um, and this will play out over a number of years, but that would really be helpful from the UNESCOs and from the OECDs, um, who are already starting to build up this, this knowledge base. Um, but clearly, that there are going to be some things that work well and some that don't. Um, we also engaged children. We did a policy, created a policy guidance on AI for children, and engaged children in that process. And it was a very meaningful and necessary process that really, you know, informed and enriched the product. So it's really you know, encouraging to hear about the, the multi-stakeholder approach that's that's ongoing, not just ad hoc. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of a request. And perhaps if you have any thoughts on kind of how you see these approaches may play out if we look ahead, um, and and what kind of role the organisations that you're in might play, not just kind of documenting and um, looking at at how um, how it may be, uh, what may be governed, but actually in how. Thank you. First of all, as a, as a mom, I would love to see that information about AI and children, so that's, that's fantastic. But it did, um, on your comment about needing to do the analysis about what's working and what's not, um, I think one, th I, I, and again, this is where we need to also build that capacity globally, uh, because it's one thing for Canada to do analysis and maybe what's working in Canada, but we have to really understand, you know, what are the risks, what, how is it impacting uh, in different communities and different countries. Um, but this is where we have been working, and I don't know if there's any colleagues in the room, but we have the International Development Research Centre in Canada, IDRC, and they do a lot of the funding uh, and capacity building uh, in different nodes around the world, and specific on AI. AI capacity building and research. And so that's where we've also had to really, you know, link up so that we could be leveraging as fast as possible the research that they're also supporting. So again, it's just always, uh, again, it's challenging ourselves as policymakers that we have to keep seeking it out. Um, but the, there is that research and I, we just need more of it. I think I just wanted to advocate for that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for that question. Um, definitely support multi-stakeholder participation and the um, uh, stake engaging stakeholders in the process of policymaking itself. One challenge that we see a lot is that um, there's not there's no level playing field between different stakeholders. So I don't know if there are many companies in the room, but um, we often see that the, you know companies have a disproportionate advantage, I'd say, financial and access to policymakers. Um, when I mentioned at the beginning of my intervention that there's a handful of human rights folks that participate in AI governance, it really is an understatement, comparing to hundreds or actually thousands um, of folks in the public policy sector of or section of companies. So that's something that I would urge international organizations and uh, policymakers at the national level to consider that 
civil society really comes from, it, it's an uphill battle in terms of capacity, resources, um, financial, and obviously these are disp uh, marginalized groups and global majority based orgs are disproportionately hit by that. So Canada um, as a Canadian, um, as the Canadian government, I imagine you primarily engage with national stakeholders, um, which is obviously important. And I also encourage you to think how Canadian laws can um, influence, for example, global majority-based regulation. That's something we think about a lot in the EU with the so-called Brussels effect, um, understanding that many countries around the world, especially those with more repressive regimes or authoritarian practices, do not have necessarily the democratic institutional pillars that the EU or Canada would have. So that just um, a no, added nuance to multi-stakeholderism, yes, and in a way that really enables inclusive and meaningful participation of all. Thank you. Um, so a couple of quick points. First, also on, on Canada, I think they're doing a fantastic job in, for instance, Africa and Latin America with the... Uh, um, with AI for development project. And I have seen since 2019, the kind of communities that have come up and have been supported to develop, say, language data sets, which can then lead to development of applications or in healthcare or in agriculture, or just to strengthen in a more sustained way capacities of civil society organizations that can inform uh, decision making and policy making. And, we at UNESCO have particularly also benefited from this because when we have the recommendation on the ethics of AI, which is being implemented now in a lot of countries, uh, we work in a multi-stakeholder manner, right? We generally have a, a, a national multi-stakeholder group which convenes and works. And there, the capacity of civil society organizations to actually analyze the national context, contribute to these discussions is very important. So the work that Canada or IDRC and so on are doing is is actually I have over the past four or five years seen results of that in in my work itself already so so there's that's there's good credit due there uh, on on your point about policy making at the international level and recommendations and so on I think so the process of international standard and policy making has kind of evolved over the years like we used to be in a mode of technical assistance many years ago that someone will go to a country and help them develop a policy, an expert will fly in, stay there for some months and, and work. I think that model is changing. And that model is changing in the sense that you are developing policies or frameworks, I would say, at the global level with the stakeholders from the national or whatever level involved in the development of these frameworks. So what happens is that when they are developing something at the global level, and when they have to translate it at the national level, they would naturally go towards this framework on which they have worked and they have great knowledge of. And that is one, it's, a, it's an implicit way of policy development, which is over the few years that, not few, it's been actually since the early 2000s, this is the model, because otherwise there's not enough funding available, and also it's not sustainable, because you don't develop global frameworks, which are done in a more consultative manner. So there is more ownership of these frameworks, which are then uh, become the natural tool, go-to tool for at the national level as well. So that's, I think, an interesting uh, way to develop and that's why we are talking about multi-stakeholderism. A lot of times in fora like this, multi-stakeholderism just becomes a buzzword. Yes, we should have everyone on the table. That is not what it means. You need to be, and we've actually produced a guidance on how to develop AI policies from drafting, from agenda setting to drafting to implementation and monitoring along the policy cycle in a, in a multi-stakeholder manner. And there's a short video also I'm happy to share later if we can share it with the community, yeah. Thank you very much. I know we have one speaker, um, just really quickly, if you could make your question and then I have three more interventions from people including online, so maybe they can consider your question and their responses and if not, then we can come back to it at the end. I just wanna ensure that we make uh, time for them. So if you can be brief, that'd be very much appreciated. 
So I can ask a question. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Svetlana Zens, Article 19. I'm working on engaging tag for internet freedoms uh, on Asia countries, Myanmar, Vietnam, China. And my question actually is, I mean, I think it's like more of a UNESCO and Canada at some point because, um, I mean, the ones who are providing some global policies. Um, would you recommend some uh, mechanisms which we could implement in authoritarian, authoritarian regime countries to monitor the responsible AI, especially from the private sector side? Because in the Western world or the world which is like more human rights friendly, it's more easier to implement those policies rather than in authoritarian countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll be coming back to these questions as well. And I think that's actually a little bit of a good segue to the next intervention. I'm going to turn to Shala, who's joining online from Google, from the private sector, um, as it's important to consider all stakeholders in the room. Um, Shala, if you're connected with us, um, I, I think my question for you is, aside from these government and kind of multilateral efforts, it's obviously clear that the private sector plays a key role in promoting um, human rights and AI governance frameworks. So if you could speak about um, really, your work at Google, um, what's its perspective and ongoing efforts on AI governance and how you're working to promote human rights. And if you can speak to the questions that's been asked, that'd be fantastic as well. And thank you so much for joining and your patience. Sure, thank you so much for having me today. Um, and, and apologies, I was unable to join in person, but I, I really do appreciate the chance to sort of join virtually. I'll try to keep this brief. I, I wanna make sure we get to sort of a, a more dynamic set of questions. And um, I know there are other speakers as well, but to sort of take a step back, I, I, I sit on Google's human rights program. Um, and that is, you know, for those who are not familiar, it's a central function responsible for ensuring that we're upholding our human rights commitments. And I can share more on that later, but, but it really applies across all the company's products and services across all regions. And so this includes overseeing the strategy on human rights, advising product teams on potential actual human rights impacts, um, quite relevant to this discussion, it's conducting human rights due diligence and engaging external uh, experts, rights holders, stakeholders, et cetera. And so maybe just to take a kind of brief step back, I'll, I'll just sort of share a little bit of our starting point as a company, which is, which is really true excitement about the ways that AI can advance human rights and, and really create opportunities for people across the globe. And so, you know, I think that that doesn't just mean sort of in, t in terms of kind of potential advancements, but really progress that we're all re already seeing, putting more information in the hands of human rights defenders in whatever country they are in, um, keeping people safer from floods and fires, particularly knowing that um, it you know affects uh, disproportionately the global majority, increasing access to healthcare. One that I'm particularly excited about is um, something we call our 1000 languages initiatives, which is really working on building AI models that support the you know, 1000 most widely spoken languages. We obviously live in a world where there are you know, over 7000 languages. And so I think it's a drop in the bucket, but, but we hope that it's sort of a, a useful starting point. Um, but to sort of, you know, again, um, turn to our topic at hand, none of this is possible if AI is not developed responsibly. And as was sort of noted in the introduction, this really is an effort that necessarily needs to have government, civil society organizations, and the private sector involved in a really deeply collaborative process, maybe one that we haven't even seen before, potentially. Um, for us as a company, the starting point for kind of responsible AI development and deployment is human rights. Um, so for those who are, who are maybe less familiar with, with the work that we do in this space is, um, you know, Google's made a number of commitments to respecting the rights enshrined by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is turning 75 this year, um, and it's implementing treaties, as well as the UN guiding principles on business and, and human rights, which I think Marlena um, mentioned in the beginning. So, you know, what does that actually look like in practice? Um, so, you know, as part of this years ago in, in 2018, when we established our AI principles, we embedded human rights into them. So for those who are not familiar, our AI principles describe our objectives to develop technology responsibly but also um, outlines some specific application areas that we will not pursue. And that includes technologies whose purpose contravenes international law and human rights. So if I'm kind of providing a, a bit of a tangible example, let's think, let's imagine that we're sort of thinking of developing a new product like, like BARD, which we released earlier this year. Um, this would go through our AI principles review via our responsible innovation team. And as part of that process, my team would also conduct human rights due diligence 
to identify any potential harms and develop alongside various teams, legal um, and product teams in particular, appropriate um, mitigations around them. And so one example of this, which um, we can sort of share around, which is a, a public case study that we've released uh, is around our celebrity recognition API. So back in the sort of in 2019, you know, we already saw that the kind of streaming era had brought, you know, a, a really remarkable explosion of video content. And in many ways, that was fantastic. More documentaries, more access for filmmakers to sort of showcase and share their work globally and so on. But, but there was also a really big challenge, which was video was pretty much unsearchable without, you know, expensive uh, labor intensive tagging processes. This made it really difficult and expensive for creators um, so, you know, a discussion popped up about better image and video capabilities to recognize sort of an international roster of celebrities as a starting point. Uh, so our AI principles review in this process triggered kind of additional human rights due diligence. And we brought on Business for Social Responsibility, BSR, which, which some are familiar with to help us conduct sort of a formal human rights assessment on the potential impact of a tool like this on human rights. Kind of fast forward, the outcome of this was it was a very tightly scoped offering, um, one that defined celebrity quite carefully, uh, established manual customer review processes, instituted um, really an expanded terms of service. All of this actually ended up also later informing our company-wide stance on facial recognition, um, and and you know took into consideration quite a bit of stakeholder engagement in the process. All though it was developed more recently um, than this particular human rights assessment. I'll also plug in the ECNL framework for meaningful engagement uh, because it served as a really helpful guide for us um, since its release. So I, I just want to share this example um, for two reasons. One is just human rights and, and sort of the established ways of assessing impact on human rights have been embed embedded into our international uh, into our internal AI governance processes from the beginning. And two, as a result of that, we've actually been doing human rights due diligence on AI related products and, and features for, for years. And that's been a priority for us as a company for quite a long time. To sort of take a very brief um, kind of note to, to sort of your, the second part of your question, I'll, I'll just sort of um, flag that. I think we really do need everybody at the table and that's not always the case right now as, as others had mentioned. Um, you know, we were excited just as an example to be part of the moment at the White House over the summer, at the U.S. White House over the summer, that brought together industry to commit to advancing responsible practices in the development of AI. And earlier this fall, we did sort of um, release our company's progress against those commitments, and that included uh, launching a beta of SynthID, uh, SynthID, which is a new tool we developed for watermarking and identifying AI-generated images of really core component of informing the development of that particular product was concerns from civil society organizations and academics um, and, and individuals and sort of the global majority, keeping in mind that we have 75 elections happening globally next year, um, really concerns around misinformation and, and the potential proliferation of misinformation, um, establishing an, a dedicated AI red team, uh, co-establishing the frontier model form to sort of develop standards and benchmarks for emerging safety issues. Um, but we're, you know, we think these commitments and, and companies progress against them is, is an important step in the ecosystem of governance, but they really are just a step. So we're particularly eager to see kind of more space for industry to come together with governments and civil society organizations, more conversations like this. Um, I think Tara mentioned the Freedom Online Coalition. So it could be through existing spaces like FOC or the Global Network Initiative, but also you know, potentially new spaces um, as we find that it's necessary. And so I'll just kind of mention one last thing briefly. <laughs> so I know I'm probably over my time um, because it did sort of come up. Um, more specifically, I'll just flag that when, when developing AI regulation um, at Google, at the very least, we sort of think about it in a few ways. We've been thinking about it as something called the four S's, you know, the structure of the regulation. Is it international? Is it domestic? Is it vertical? Is it horizontal? Um, the scope of the regulation, how's AI being defined, which is not the easiest thing to do in the world. <laughs> um, the subjects of, of regulation, developers, deployers, uh, and, and finally, the standards of the regulations, what risks, um, how do we consider those difficult trade-offs that were mentioned earlier um, by, by some, um, by I think the person who asked the first question. So these are just sort of some of the things that we're taking into consideration this process, but we're really uh, hoping that more multi-stakeholder conversations will 
lead to some international coordination on this front uh, because our concern is that you know otherwise we'll have a bit of a hodgepodge of regulation around the world and in the worst case scenario i think it makes it difficult for companies to comply and and stifles innovation um, potentially cuts off populations from what could be potentially transformative technology and it might not be so much the case for us at google where we've you know we have the resources to make significant investments in compliance and, and regional expertise, but but we do think it would be um, could be a potential issue for 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 smaller players and sort of future players in the space. So I'll I'll pause there uh, because I think I probably took up too much time, but appreciate it and, and looking forward to the Q and A. Thank you so much, Charlotte, for that overview. That was uh, that was great, and thank you for highlighting the work that's happening at Google to support human rights in this context. Um, particularly, you're um, working on due diligence, for example, um, I, and as well as you noting the need for collaboration and considering global majority perspectives. I think that's key as well. Um, so, what I'd like to do now is turn to Vladimir as our second to last uh, intervention of the session, and then hopefully turning to a couple questions at the end. Um, I think that um, we've heard from a couple different stakeholders at this point. Um, but I think the question for you is, do you think that the global majority is able to engage in these processes? Do you think that they are able to effectively shape the conversations that are happening at this point? Um, and I think that, you know, that Echo Cicitales has spoken about the need to consider local um, perspectives. And I'm curious to hear from you is, why is this so critical and, and kind of what is the work that you're doing now? Um, and if we can keep an intervention to about four or five minutes, that'd be fine, but don't want to cut you off. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll try to be brief. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for the question. It's a hard question. And also for the invitation uh, to be part of this panel, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I'm Vladimir Garay, part of Derechos Digitales, a Latin American digital rights organization. And for the last couple of years, we've been researching about the deployment of AI systems in our region in the context of public policy. Uh, part of that work has been founded by IDRC, so thank you. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that later. But if you're interested, uh, you can go to ia.derechosdigitales.org. And if the URL in Spanish confuses you, uh, you come to me and I can give you one of these, and you can find it more easily. So regarding you, your question, even though there are interesting efforts being developed right now, I think Latin America mostly have lacked the ability to meaningfully engage and shape processes for responsible AI governance. And this is consequence of different challenges faced by, Latin by the Latin American region on the local, the regional, and the global context. For example, in the local context, one of the main challenges has to do with the designing of governance instances that are inclusive and that can engage meaningfully with a wide range of actors, which is at least partly consequence of a long history of authoritarianism that results on frail democracies that are suspicious of participation, that are dismissive of human rights impacts, or that lack the necessary institutional capacities to implement solutions that acknowledge broad, inclusive, transparent participation. On the global context, we have to address the eagerness of the tech industry for pushing aggressively a technology that is still not completely mature in terms of our understanding of it, how we think about it, how we think about its limitations, and how do we demythologize it. And one of the consequences of, 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 of this is the proliferation of different proposals for guidance, uh, legal, ethical, and more, so many that it's hard to keep up. So there is a sense of overwhelming necessity and inevitability, which is a difficulty on itself. Now, also from um, in, in the global context, I think Latin America and global majority perspectives are often overlooked and disregarded in the international debate about technology governance, probably because from a technical or uh, an engineering standpoint, the number of artificial intelligence systems that are being developed in Latin America might seem marginal which is true, uh, especially when compared to those created in North America, Europe, and part of Asia. But our region has a fundamental role in the production of AI systems, and a better understanding of global majority and Latin American countries' relationship with AI can be illuminating, not just for Latin America, but for, for the AI governance fields as a whole. How should it look like and what should it include? So, First, I think it's important to consider the different roles of global majority countries, and in particular Latin American countries, in the global chain of artificial intelligence development. 
Our region has a fundamental role in the production of AI systems, for example, as a provider of lithium and other minerals necessary for the manufacturing of different components of AI systems. Of course, as you all know, mining consumes big amounts of non-renewable energy, energy and has important environmental, environmental, ah, sorry, environmental impacts, including air pollution and water contamination that can lead to the destruction of habitats and the loss of biodiversity. It also has a severe impact on the health of the miners, many of whom work in precarious conditions. Latin America also provides data, raw data, that is collected from different sources by different means and that is used to train and refine AI models, data that is often collected as a consequence of the lack of proper protection of people's right to their personal information. And most of the time, people's data get input on AI systems without people's consent or even their knowledge. Latin America also provides labor, labor necessary to train AI systems by labeling data for machine learning. These are usually low paid jobs performed also under very precarious conditions that can har harmful impacts on the emotional and mental health of people. For example, when reviewing data for content moderation purposes. It is also the very foundation of any AI system, but its value is severely underst underestimated and not properly compensated. In summary, Latin America provides material resources necessary for the development of AI systems that are being designed somewhere else and later sold back to us and deployed in our countries, perpetuating logics of dependency and extractivism. So we are both the providers of the inputs and the paying clients of, for the outputs. But the processes that determine AI governance are often far removed from a region. Um, responsible AI governance should consider the different impacts of AI development on human rights, including the ones that are a result of the extraction of these material resources, environmental human rights, workers' rights, and the right to data protection, privacy, and autonomy, which are greatly impacted in regions like Latin America. Now, at Derechos Digitales, we have been looking into different implementations of AI systems through public policy, uh, because the main way most people interact with this type of technologies in our region is in their relationship with the state, even if they're not always aware of this. Uh, and what we've seen is that states are using AI for mediating the relationship with citizens, for surveilling purposes, for making decisions regarding welfare assistance, and for controlling the access and the use of welfare programs. However, most of the time, our research shows that these technologies are deployed without meeting transparency or participa participation standards, uh, they lack human rights approaches, and do not consider open, transparent, and participatory evalu evaluation processes. There are many reasons for this, from corruption to the lack of capacities, and disregard for human rights impacts, as I mentioned earlier. But we need to co overcome this reality, which implies to address the asymmetries among different regions re related to the strengthening of democratic institutions. International cooperation is key, and civil society organizations in our region are playing a major role promoting that change. So I I'll keep it here for now. Thank you. Thank you, Vladimir, for speaking about kind of the need for regional perspectives and highlighting how these need to feed into global conversations and including specifically how regional developments um, are necessary to consider in the context of AI development. I think that's really helpful. I'm going to turn to our last speaker now, Oyabisi, who, um, who I believe is joining us from about 5 a.m. Um, and has been online for a very long time, so definitely deserves a round of applause. So last but definitely not least. So my question to you finally is, um, building on the previous comments, um, how do we ensure that, uh, similarly, that African voices are represented in efforts on um, responsible AI governance and to promote human rights? And I'm going to weave in a question from online that we've received as well, which I think might be related if you're able to respond to that as well, which is, what suggestions can be given to African countries as they prepare strategies or policies on emerging technologies such as AI, specifically considering the risks and benefits? So again, thank you so much for your patience and thank you for being with us. Cheers. Yes, and thank you so much, um, Hayan, for for inviting me to speak this um, this morning. Um, I think, in terms of African voices, we all would agree that um, the African region is coming late to the party at this time, and we now need to find a way of uh, peer pressuring 
the continent to get into the debate. Um, doing this would mean that we are also doing ourselves as other regions a favor, understanding that the continent has a very huge population and that human rights abuses on the continent itself would also snowball into um, developmental challenges that we do not want across the world. So this is the context for which we would have to ensure that we are not leaving the African continent behind, uh, especially given the fact that our governments have not been able to figure, and this would speak to the question that has been asked by uh, that colleague, our, our governments have not prioritized uh, the governance of AI. Of course, we need to think of the governance of AI within the hard and the soft law, but also understanding um, the life cycle of the AI itself, and how do we ensure that along all of the life cycle, we have a government that understands that, a civil society organization as well that understands that, and a business that understands that, and it was great listening to um, the colleague from Google who was talking about how Google has a human rights program. How do we then, within a more stakeholder approach, uh, bring that understanding to anticipate some of the rights challenges with my, we might see with um, artificial intelligence, but also then plan as uh, through a multi-stakeholder approach to be able to mitigate those. And this is where governments would now need to see civil society organizations not as enemies, but as allies, and helping to bring those voices uh, together. Of course, we should understand that at some point, the politics of AI would also come to bear because, you know, on the on the continent itself, we do not have all of the resources in terms of intellectual property to be able to, you know, develop the coding and all of these algorithms that follows that. Bit. Our universities are not prepared for that yet. Uh, but again, dealing with the technicalities as well, we have to also build some level of competence. Plus also understanding that in terms of international uh, governance of AI and the setting up of international bodies, the African region would have to ensure that you know, our, our, our missions abroad, especially those that would be relating with the UN, must have the right capacity to take part in the negotiations. And that's why, again, I like how uh, the colleague from Canada said that you know, we would have these contestations and they are very necessary because it is within these contestations that we'll be able to bring the diversity of opinions and thoughts to the table, such that we have policies that can help us to address some of these challenges that we might see now and in the future. But how are we preparing, how are we going to prepare ourselves as Africans to be able to uh, negotiate and negotiate better? And this speaks to the role of the African Union, including ECOWAS and other regional bodies. I do think the European Union is also setting um, the agenda and, and, and the kind of um, model for Africans and other regions to also follow in terms of the deep dive that they've done with uh, the AI treaty and how they are using that to help shape how we can have a, a good human rights approach to uh, to hear itself. So now as, uh, answering the question directly, you know, that you posed to me is to say that uh, whatever advice we would give the African government would also be within the context of what, what we have seen. Uh, one is to understand that uh, hard laws may not necessarily be the starting point for African government. It might be soft laws, working with um, uh, technology platforms to look at code of conduct and using lessons from there to progress to add laws. Of course, also understanding that, you know, our governments must begin to think regulation in ways that balances um, the need of citizens and some of the disadvantages that we do not see or do we do not want to see, but that we bring citizens themselves into the conversation such that we are also, you know, encouraging innovation. As much as we're encouraging innovation, we're also ensuring that the rights of others are not abused. Uh, it's going to be a long walk to freedom. 
how have that journey more start with you know africans uh, african civil society african businesses african governments investing in uh, the right set of uh, meetings investing in the right set of research investing also in the right set of engagements that can get us uh, again to become part of the global uh, conversation but also understanding that the regional elements of uh, the conversations also must be uh, taken on board of especially given the fact that human rights abuses uh, across the region is becoming um, alarming and that we now have more governments that are interested in uh, not opening the space, uh, not you know being inclusive. Rather, you know, uh, they want to uh, muffle voices. You know, so, you know, uh, they also are not opening. Freedom of association itself is also affected. So when you look at the civic space ranking of um, civic cause for the region itself, it then again gives the picture as to how somewhere somehow as this some of these conversations might not necessarily be something that would excite uh, the region. But again, this is an assumption. We can still, again, begin to look for that stakeholder pressure in ways that brings the African government to the table, in ways that helps them to see the need for this, and also the need for us to get our voices into global uh, platforms. Thank you, ABC. Um, it's great, and thank you for stressing, again, the importance of the multi-stakeholder approach, the need for civil society and governments to work together, and bringing in this diversity of perspectives um, and African voices and governments to the table, um, which requires preparation as well, so, so thank you. Um, I guess to the organizers in the IGF, I'm not sure what the timing is in terms of whether we'll be kicked out of the room or not, so if there is a session immediately afterwards, I'm not entirely certain, but I don't see anyone cutting. Me off. I think it's a lunch break. So what I'll do is I'll just say some brief final comments, um, and then if anyone has any particular questions or wants to come up to the speakers, it might be a more helpful way of moving forward. I don't want to stand in between people and their food. Never a good position to be in. Pratik, if you want to make one final I think final there was one. a question from... Yeah, yeah you can... Uh, I mean, I have no answer, but I think it's an important question. So we, if I think it's always tricky, particularly when we are dealing with authoritarian regimes and to put in frameworks which may be used in whatever way possible. So I have no answer, but I think it's an important question, so we should give some time to that. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that um, I think we began this session with a really crucial acknowledgement that there are truly glaring gaps in what is existing in the discourse between human rights and AI governance, um, and that it's a really key for all stakeholders to come in for global perspectives from the industry, from civil society, from governments, from other champions on these issues. I think we've just started to shine a spotlight on these issues. Um, so I think that we've also journeyed through what is really needed in terms of looking at a human rights approach to AI governance. I think it's one piece of the pie, but a critical one. Um, and I think that it's just key that we continue to firmly uh, root all uh, efforts on AI governance in the international human rights framework. So thank you so much to the speakers in person here and those online. Thank you for your patience and apologies for going over and apologies for not being able to field all the questions, but would encourage you guys to continue to uh, uh, come up personally and speak to speakers yourself. Thank you.